Well, good morning, Southside. And I feel very privileged to bring the Word of God to you this morning, but before I do, uh, let's go before the Lord and ask Him to bless our time in it. Heavenly Father, You have done an unimaginable thing for us in sending Your Son, Jesus, to come and live life among us perfectly, and then to go up on a tree to bear our sins that we might be redeemed and bought and brought back to you. God, we are overwhelmed by what you have done for us. And our lives now are singing and screaming at us to go and live in thankfulness and in gratitude to what you have done. And this morning, God, we're going to look at your word in Romans 12, and we are going to see commands that we are not able to obey on our own. We need your strength. We need your help. So God, as we come upon Romans 12, 9, and we hear the command to love without hypocrisy, I ask that you would cause your spirit to work within us. Cause your spirit to move. That we might respond in obedience and live out this love that you have called us to and be pleasing to you in so doing. Your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So like Ken said, I had the privilege to teach this passage back in May to the college group, and they had the privilege to suffer through it. So the first thing I want to say is directed towards the college group this morning. I don't know if you guys are sitting over here or spread out this morning, but um, you guys heard this message back in May, and so... I just want to plea with you this morning, don't tune me out just because you've heard this before. Sin is like a cancerous tumor. We go in with the word and we seek to remove it, but we don't get it all. And it starts to grow back. So we have to take care of it again and again and again. And hopefully we get more and more and more of it each time. And hopefully it comes back slower and slower. And like Ken said, this passage brought me under great conviction again this week like it did back in May. Back in May, I studied it, and I was brought under great conviction, and God used it to purify me. But when I came before it this week, I found that a lot of that sin that we had dealt with back in May had returned or was still remaining and was growing again. And so I can assume the same thing has happened in a lot of your lives. So please don't tune me out. Bring your hearts this morning humbly to the Word of God. And then let's go back under the knife and ask God to remove our sins once more. For everyone else, I want to give quick, a quick three foundational points. We've been going through Romans for four years in the college group, and a lot of you here probably have a good understanding of Romans, but um, not everybody does. And so I want to give you three foundational points because I think they're vitally important to understanding our passage and obeying it and applying it correctly. And so first point that I want you to know is that in Romans 12, you come into Romans 12, I have plugs in my eyes because I had eye surgery and there's just tears flowing all over the place. There's nowhere for my tears to drain. I don't know why I'm telling you that. Okay. (laughs) You come to Romans 12 and Paul has labored for 11 chapters to give us just solid, deep doctrine about the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then you come into Romans 12 and it's just a bunch of commands. But those commands do not come in a vacuum. They come following that doctrine. And so the first point that I want to point out to you today is that this command that we're going to see today is a response. It is a response to what God has done for us in the gospel, what God has done for us that is explained in Romans 1 through 11. We don't do this so that what happened in Romans 1 through 11 comes to pass. We do this because what happened in Romans 1 through 11 has come to pass, and is coming to pass. God has already worked, and now this is a response. It's a response. You get through the first 11 chapters of Romans, and you get to the end of chapter 11, and you are just screaming with joy because of all that God has done for you, and you agree heartily with Paul, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You get to the end, and you're just left with a sense of awe and wonder and amazement and thankfulness at what God has done. And so we agree with Paul with what he says at the end of Romans 11. And we're left just wanting to give our lives away in service to God. And so Paul comes and he brings us into chapter 12 and he says, Therefore, he says, Therefore I urge you, 
brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So he comes into chapter 12, and he doesn't say, do this so that Romans 1 and 11, through 11 is true for you. He says, therefore, God has done this. Therefore, I'm going to call you, and God is going to call you and command you to live in this way. Theologians like to say that the imperatives of the Christian life flow from the indicatives. Indicatives are statements of fact, statements of truth. And so what is true, if you are a Christian, is that you've been bought and redeemed by the blood of Christ. You've been justified in God's sight. You've been given a new heart, which longs to obey God and enables you to be obedient from the heart, and he has placed his spirit within you. Those are the indicatives, the statements of truth, the statements of fact. And Paul says, therefore, in light of those statements of fact, live this way, live this way. And so that brings us into chapter 12, and he's going to tell us how to live. And he says, what do you do? You're screaming with him. I hope you're screaming with him. I'm screaming with him. God, I just want to give my life to you. What do I do? And Paul says, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so if you read the gospel, if you understand the gospel, if you think about the gospel, if you are a Christian, you should be overwhelmed by gratitude and thankfulness. And this should motivate you to live. And Paul is going to tell you how to live. And he says, just give your life. Not just your Sunday mornings, not just Bible time. Give your entire life as a sacrifice to God holy and acceptable to him. And this will be your way of worshiping. It's not just showing up on Sunday and singing and saying, I worshiped God. Worshiping God and thankfulness to the gospel is the entire Christian life. The entire Christian life. And you say, how do we do this? I want to give my life to this, Paul. You've called me to. I agree. So he goes on and he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so if you're going to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, your life as a sacrifice, he says don't let your life be conformed to this world. The way the world lives, the way the world thinks, the way the world feels, what the world longs for. We're not called to live like that as Christians. We're called to live differently. And he says in order to live differently, you must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is not enough just to say, go and live differently. He says you have to start to think differently. You have to start to think differently. And these different thinking processes will form emotions and convictions in your heart, which will cause you to go and live this life which is pleasing to God. And so the first reminder is that this is a response. We're going to come into Romans 12.9 today. Don't read it as a way of saying, I have to do this. Don't hear this as saying, I, I, it's a way I have to do this in order to gain God's favor. This is a response, and it flows from all that he's done for us. That is the first reminder. The second point is that <clears throat> this is enabled by God through the gospel. So first, this is a response. Second, this is enabled by God through the gospel. All of the commands of the Christian life are not possible for a non-Christian. It's not possible. You go, you read the first three and a half chapters of Romans, two and a half chapters of Romans, you get to the middle of chapter three, and Paul has labored to show that the heart of a non-believer is set out against God. It doesn't want to obey him, and it can't. And so a non-Christian comes to this text, and they can't do anything with it. But in the gospel, God has given us a new heart. Romans 6 says that he has taken us from being slaves of sin, and he has made us slaves of righteousness, so that we might be obedient from the heart. And so first, this is a response Second, this is enabled by God through the gospel. And third, this is empowered by God through the Holy Spirit. And I think this is the one we probably miss most of all. I think the temptation of the Christian life is we know God has brought us into this saving relationship with him. And now we're here. And especially as Americans, we're just independent. And so we want to go and we just say, okay, he says do this. I'll go do this and do this and do this. And so we seek to live the Christian life by our own strength. But that's not how we live the Christian life. Romans 8 teaches that we must walk by the Spirit of God who he has given to us and who he is the one who enables us to live this life. And so when we come upon these commands, it is a response 
that has been enabled by God through the gospel, and it is empowered, has been empowered by His Holy Spirit. And so that's the context of our passage today. He goes in 3 through 8 of chapter 12, and he talks about humility and using gifts to serve the body, and then we come to our verse in chapter 9. So please turn your attention to Romans 12, 9 and read it with me. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. For those of you who like outlines, I have two points for you. You might look at this text and say that seems like a three-point outline, but I have two. So your first point is going to be abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Everything else just throw in an introduction. And uh, that's the only time I'm mentioning an outline, so good luck. (laughs) Paul says, in light of the gospel, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. We all know, as Christians, the importance of love. We know that. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul says God has taught us to love. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning, I'm not going to spend any time actually telling you to love. What does interest me, though, is how Paul qualifies this command to love. He doesn't say love passionately, love all the time, or any other description. What he does is he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Some of your Bibles might say genuine or sincere. Let love be genuine, let love be sincere. So what I want to do is I want to ask and answer two very important questions about this non-hypocritical love. First question. What does it mean to love without hypocrisy? What does that even mean? I think a a good way to answer that is to ask, well, what is hypocrisy? What is hypocrisy? So if you could flip quickly to Matthew 23, we get a good picture of what is hypocrisy in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Jesus is blistering the scribes and the Pharisees. He gives them eight woes. He calls them hypocrites seven times. And so I think this is a good passage of Scripture to ask, what does it mean to be a hypocrite? Because Jesus is just blasting these hypocrites. We're not going to look at the whole passage, but just turn your attention to verses 27 and 28 because it gives us a good idea of what it means to be a hypocrite. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so the scribes and the Pharisees had their system of doing things. And by all appearances, they looked great. They looked righteous. People looked upon them and said, I don't know how they live in such a righteous way. But inside, God saw, Christ saw right through them, and inside they were like dead bones in a tomb. And so what it means, I think, primarily to be a hypocrite is that on the outside, you look good. On the outside, you do what is right. And on the inside, you are nothing like that. You only do the right things, and you don't feel the right things. That was what the Pharisees did, and they were here were rebuked for appearing righteous. And in our passage in Romans 12, if you want to flip back there, we are warned and commanded against only appearing loving. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. And what he is saying, that it, is, it is not just enough for us to do loving things. We must... Instead, think internally. We must match what is outside. So outside, we are loving. Inside, we must also be loving. So we must think. Paul says you must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We must think in a loving way. And those loving thoughts must spurn on loving feelings and loving emotions. Otherwise, it's not pleasing to God. And as Christians, we have been given this new heart that does love. But there are times if we admit it, that we are not loving from our hearts. We just go and serve and do, and our heart is calloused inside. So what do we do in these situations? If that's not pleasing to God, because my heart is not loving, 
then do I just say, well, it's not pleasing, I'm not going to do it. I don't think that's what God wants us to do. Remember what I just said. This command has to be a response to the gospel. It's been enabled through the gospel, and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're struggling with a heart that is not loving, what you have to do is bring yourself before God and ask that His Spirit would work within you and cause this loving heart to spring up and to grow. And then out of that loving heart, let loving deeds, loving actions flow. So here Paul commands us, don't just love externally. And you say, why? Why is that a big deal? It doesn't seem like a big deal if I love fake. I mean, no one else knows. As far as they know, I care a lot about them. I help a lot. So why should we love without hypocrisy? Three reasons. First one from the context here. This is how we love in a way that actually pleases God. When we love without hypocrisy, it pleases God. And there are people here who serve great, and I hope you all serve out of a heart of love. But if you're the best person who helps people move and your heart is not with love, or you set up the chairs or help at weddings or events and say, I'm doing the loving thing, but your heart is not loving, and those deeds aren't flowing from a loving heart, God sees right through your actions to your heart, and he is not pleased. That should be enough to motivate us to love without hypocrisy. I want to please God. That's the first reason. Second reason, I think a plurality of scriptures indicate that a non-genuine love is fruitless in helping to edify our brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't help. A genuine love is what is going to produce fruit in their lives. And then third, 2 Corinthians 6, Paul is talking about his gospel ministry. And he says his ministry's point is to say, this is the day of salvation. He pleads with people to come to Christ. And in that pleading, he makes sure that he keeps his character and his actions a certain way so that he does not uh, discredit his ministry. He doesn't want to discredit his ministry because he wants people to be saved. And so he goes and he lists in 2 Corinthians 6 a number of qualities and characteristics. And you come to verse 6, and one of the qualities he lists is genuine, non-hypocritical love. And so what Paul is telling us is, if you love without hypocrisy, it will destroy your gospel ministry. It will destroy evangelism. Evangelism is not just going and telling people about Jesus and then moving on saying, I did my duty. True evangelism flows out of a heart of love for people. You see them. They're lost. They're dying. They're on their way to destruction. And your heart hurts. So you say, friend, come to Jesus. But if all you do is go and you share the gospel without true, genuine love, Paul says it will destroy and discredit your gospel ministry. So those are three reasons. You can see by those three reasons that hypocritical love shatters the Christian life that we are called to. If you can't help edify believers, if you can't help evangelize the lost, and none of it's pleasing to God, loving hypocritically makes it impossible. to. I mean, what else is there to live for as a Christian? That is the Christian life. Building up your brothers and sisters seeking to help save the lost, and in all of it, seeking to please God. And if you can do none of it, hypocritical love makes the Christian life impossible. So let's love without hypocrisy. I hope you're saying that with me. Yes, let's love without hypocrisy. But what does that look like practically? And Paul is going to spend the rest of this morning telling us what it looks like. So look back at Romans 12.9 here. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. It's five words. Some of your Bibles might say, let love be genuine, let love be sincere. In the Greek, it's actually only three words. And if you were to read it very literally, it would just say, the love sincere. Or the genuine love, the sincere love, the non-hypocritical love. It almost reads like a title to a heading, or a heading to a section. And following is going to be the description of what it means to love without hypocrisy. 
We have a picnic today after church, and I've seen some of you salivate over the food there. And so it's kind of like me coming up to those people and saying, the perfect church picnic. And those people that really love church picnics and the food there are going to say, yes, tell me what that picnic looks like. And they'll get really excited about it. And Paul is coming before us today. And as Christians, we've been given new hearts that long to love without hypocrisy. And so Paul comes up and he's just going to say, the sincere love. And we should all be eagerly exclaiming, yes, Paul, that's what I want. What does a sincere love look like? What does it look like? Tell me. And he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us in the second half of this verse. So Romans 12, 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. And then he gives us the first description of what that non-hypocritical love looks like. He says, Abhor what is evil. It's kind of interesting to think about. Very first thing he says. He says, you want to love genuinely? you got to hate. And if you're like me, you say, what? We're Christians. I thought we don't hate. Even society seems to get that. We don't hate. Society seems to be built on that principle. It's taught from our very youth. And here we are being commanded to hate. It's very interesting. I used to work in a nursery uh, at a playroom kind of thing in a gym. And You'd see, you get to see the depravity of little kids when you work in nurseries. Um, <laughs> but so often, you'd see one kid come up to another kid. For example, let's say it's, it's uh, Tommy and Susie. And Susie comes up to Tommy, and Tommy's got a toy. And Susie wants to play with that toy. Tommy doesn't want to share. And so what does Susie do? She shoves over Tommy. Tommy starts to cry. You look, and you hear Susie shout, Tommy! I hate you. And if there's a parent in the room or another coworker, what you immediately hear is, Susie, we don't say that. That word's too strong. We don't say hate. And yet here we are being commanded to hate. And so next time you're in a nursery, maybe if you're working in the nursery back there or you're with one of your friends and they have a child and they say they hate someone, and you hear them say that to their kid. We don't say that. Lean over to the kid and say, Susie, you can hate. It's okay. <laughs> don't, don't actually do that. <laughs> I, I understand why we tell kids that. It's wrong for us to hate that which is meant to be cherished and loved and cared for. But what, we're being, what we are being told here is that it is not wrong to hate everything. Actually, what we're being told here and throughout the rest of Scripture, is that if you love something, that will necessitate a hatred for anything that is opposed to that something. I don't think I have to illustrate that for you to get that. Husbands, think of your wives or your kids. Someone breaks into your house with the intent to murder them. Do you hate that idea? You love your wife and you hate the idea of someone coming in and trying to stab her to death? Or are you just going to sit back and say, well, I'm loving, he can do it. You're not going to do that. Think of the example of a couple months ago, there was a man in Florida. And his son was playing by the water and an alligator came up. Young son, you guys have heard this story. And he came up and he grabbed the kid. That dad loved his son. He says, if I don't do anything, my son's life is going to be gone. And he hated that idea. And so he ran to the alligator and he grabbed the alligator and he tried to pry its jaw open. Ultimately, he failed and the alligator ripped his son away. And that's a sad story, but it illustrates something for us. This principle that love for something necessitates a hatred for anything that is opposed to that something. Psalm 97.10 says, Hate evil, you who love the Lord. And if our lives are going to be an act of love and worship and sacrifice and service to God, because we love Him, 
then we must also hate what is opposed to God. And we'll get to that in a second. First, what does it mean to abhor? What does it mean to hate? Some of your Bibles might say. Abhor, hate. I asked this question back in May, and one of the men in the college group said a good synonym for it could maybe be disgust to the point of being sick in your stomach, almost makes you want to vomit. That's a strong way of describing it, but I think it's a good one, and I like it. And so what does it mean to abhor? I think there's three things we can glean, even from our passage here, of what it means to abhor. First, three components of abhor. First component is a mental component. To, to hate, there has to be a mental component. In order for you to feel strongly against something in here, first you have to think that is worth feeling strongly against. That's worth being wrong. And so in order to abhor what is evil, we must agree with God mentally about what is evil. Before we can hate it, we must think that it is wrong. But that's not all that is being built on here. It's not just thinking that thing is wrong, thinking that sin is wrong, thinking adultery or stealing or covetousness is wrong. Because Paul does not just say, think that evil is bad. He says, abhor what is evil, hate what is evil. That's a strong word. That is much more than just saying, think that's wrong. He's calling us to feel a strong animosity against something, a fervent passion against something, an inner disposition against something. But I don't think it stops there either. There's a mental component. There's an emotional component. But notice too, Paul is contrasting these two commands. On one hand, he says, abhor what is evil. And on the other hand, he says, cling to what is good. And he's contrasting those. And so he wants us to say, what's the difference between abhorring and clinging? And clinging means to hold on to something, to hold it close, to not let go, to love, to cherish, to value, but it, you don't let go of it. You hold on to it. And so the opposite of it, abhorring, is not just mental. It's not just emotional. There's an active component to abhorring evil. It's the opposite of holding on to. It's letting go. It's driving away. It's crushing. It's defeating. It's killing. Whatever you have to do to get rid of evil, that is the active component. I went to northern Utah at the beginning of August with um, my brother and a brother in the Lord and both their wives. And it was absolutely beautiful, but there was tons of bees everywhere. And I hate bees, mostly because I hate the idea of getting stung by one. And so when a bee comes, and they saw this many times, so they might laugh at this, but a bee comes and you hear them in your ear. First thing you do, you just kind of swing, you're like, whoa. And, uh, you hope it's gone. But usually it comes back, you hear it again. And if you really hate bees like I do and you hate the idea of getting stung, you don't just like grab the bee and say, oh, bee, I hate you, but you know, why don't you just nestle in my ear and sting me? You know, what I do is I swing again. And then I start running all around until I can't hear that bee anymore. I look crazy. But I hate the idea of getting stung. And so I don't cling to the bee. I flee from it. I flee from it. And so this is what it means to abhor. There's a mental component, an emotional component, and an active component. And in order for us to live this command rightly, we need to abhor in all of those ways. What, then, are we to abhor? Paul says evil. Paul says abhor evil. I already said it, but Psalm 97.10, Hate evil, you who love the Lord. So what is evil? Simple definition sin. That's kind of encompassing. But building off the idea that we said at the beginning that love for something necessitates a hatred for anything that is opposed to that something, I want to suggest this morning a definition of evil like this. Evil is anything that is opposed to God, His purposes, and His glory. Evil is anything that is opposed to God, His purposes, and His glory. I think Scripture builds a compelling case that that would be a good definition. If you got a better one, come tell me after the service. So we are to hate evil. We are supposed to hate what is opposed to God, 
And I think this falls into two. It falls into the evil that's out there or in the person that's next to you. And so you look out and you see idolatry, you see abortion, you see murder. You see dishonesty and corruption, lying in the workplace. Whatever it is, hate that. Yes, hate that, because it's wrong. That's wrong. But I don't think that's what Paul's primary concern and focus is here. Remember, this command to abhor what is evil is telling us what it means to love without hypocrisy. To love without hypocrisy. Turn your Bibles very quickly with me to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Ken taught on this recently. Matthew 7, 3 through 5, reads like this. Jesus, our Savior, these are his words. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you take to your brother, or say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? And what does he say? You, hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so, yes, hate the evil that you see out there. Hate the sin that you see plaguing your brothers and your sisters. But if you're like me, you come on Sundays and you hear stuff, and you feel a little bit of conviction, but you sit in your chair and you think, wow, it would be really good for so-and-so to hear this. Or, man, if if this person could just get, get over this sin that the preacher's talking about. And yet, if we're called to abhor sin, abhor evil in a non- hypocritical way, we must first look at the evil that is remaining in our flesh, in our members. So I want to ask you this morning, please, for the rest of the morning, we don't have a ton of time left, please take your eyes off the world. Take your mind off your brother and your sister in Christ who's sitting next to you, and let's look at the log in our own eyes. I want you to look at your own sin. Look at your own wickedness. Your own evil desires that are opposed to God. Because this is what it means to hate in a non-hypocritical way. We must first look at the evil that is remaining in us. And so when we are commanded to abhor what is evil, we are commanded to have an emotional displeasure with evil that is so strong so strong and intense that we want nothing to do with it. You should look at the evil remaining in your flesh. And you here are being commanded to have an emotional displeasure with it that is so strong that makes you say, I will do whatever it takes to get away from that. It's wrong. I agree with God that it's wrong. I feel a hatred towards it in my heart. And now I'm going to do whatever I have to to get rid of that sin. I will not let it remain with me. That's what we're called to this morning. And in light of the gospel, your heart should be singing, yes, that's what I want. But so often we do the opposite. We cling to evil. We don't hate it. We don't abhor it. At least not in the way that we ought to. Some of us here hate evil perfectly, but not perfectly. Some of us hate evil very well, though, comprehensively. Those three areas I listed. I don't think the mental area is where we struggle at Southside to hate evil. Right? We believe the Bible is God's word, and so we open it. And we see God hates this, and we say, that is wrong. I hate that. I don't think we struggle with that too much here at Southside. But I do see people falling in the other two areas, myself included. Some of us struggle with the emotional aspect of hating evil. We've grown up in a nice, clean home our whole life. And so we're Christians. We don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. But there's no emotional frustration, anger over sin. It's just, I don't do that. And then there's others of us who struggle with the action part. You don't hate your sin enough. 
You say you hate it, you feel the hatred, but it's not enough to compel you to go and get rid of it. So I want to ask the very important question today. How can we hate evil in the way that we ought? How can we hate evil the way that we are called to here by Paul? Turn back to Romans 12 if you're not there. Remember what I said at the very beginning. This is a response to the gospel. That is why Paul says, therefore. And so the gospel, in its many facets, is what enables and motivates us to hate sin. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, if only we could see the real nature of sin, if only we could see the real nature of sin, we would hate it. And what his point is, is that the closer you are to the vileness of something, the more you will hate it. This is true. All through high school, you hear about poverty in third world countries. And you say, wow, that's really sad. The kid doesn't have a dinner. You feel kind of bad about it. But you don't really hate it. And then maybe you're in high school or college and someone comes and gives a presentation and they throw up pictures on the projector. And now it becomes a little bit more personal. You've seen it a little bit more clearly and you say, wow, that child is very skinny. That is very sad. And some people are compelled to action by that, but a lot aren't. And then some of us are blessed and you get to go and go to one of those third world, third world countries I got to do that in 2014, and I went to India. And you go and you visit the villages. You have this idea in your head about impoverished kids and what they look like. And you get there and you say, wow, I didn't realize they would be that skinny. And so you turn to the Indian man next to you and you say, sir, how much food does that 10-year-old eat every week? And he says, oh, no. That child is not 10. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. How much food does that six-year-old, I gave myself away, how much food does that six-year-old eat every week? And he says, sir, that child is not six. That child is nine. That child is 10. They're so malnourished. They look that small. And all of a sudden, poverty and its effects become much more real to you, and you have a much stronger disgust and hate for it. It's the same way with sin. If we could just catch a glimpse, a closer glimpse of the real nature of sin, we would hate it. It's easy to look out into the world and see the effects of sin. You see the effects of abortion. Someone dies, emotional angst and problems ensue for those who terminated the life of their child. You see it with anything. You can see it with divorce and um, the effects of someone lying in the workplace and stealing. And you say, that's easy to hate because you see it. But how do we see the vile nature of the sin that remains in our members, in us? And I want to propose to you today that it is in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we most clearly see the vile nature of our sin. This is what pierced my heart this week. Mark 14, Jesus is in the garden and he's pleading with his father, God, I know your plan is to save those whom you have chosen. And if it be possible, take this cup from me. He's thinking about the wrath of God which is about to be put upon him on the cross and he says, if there is any other way to save these people, do it. Because this is fearful. The wrath of the living God is about to come upon me. So he says, if there's any other way to save these people from their sin, do it. God did not take that cup from Jesus. But he made him drink it. What this tells us is that your sin, my sin, is so great, 
so vile, so heinous, that God had to kill His only Son to save you. That's how much it took to save you. Your King, your Lord, my King, my Lord, the one whom you and I love with our inner being, died. And he took God's wrath, what we deserve to suffer for all eternity, he took in a few hours on that tree. He was up there in unimaginable pain, unimaginable agony. It's no wonder he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God's answer was, son, it is because of their sin. So hear this, Jesus did not just die for you, he died because of you. Your sin, my sin, put him on that tree. The evil put him on that tree. It caused my prince to suffer. It caused your prince to suffer. And now we're going to make light of that sin. We're going to flirt with it. We're not going to abhor it. We're not going to hate it. We're not going to do everything to separate ourselves from it. How could we? That would be the height of hypocritical love. The height of hypocritical love. Jesus' death for our sin demands that we abhor what is evil. And yet Paul, thankfully, does not just leave us with hate evil. He gives us something better to take its place. He gives us one more command. And we're going to wrap up quickly with this one. He says, there is something better than your sin. And we are to cling to that. So he says, cling to what is good. What is good? It's a good question to ask. If we're supposed to hold on to this instead of sin, we should say, what is good? The immediate context tells us that what is good is that which is in accordance with God's will. Namely, the commands given here. He says, don't pursue evil and disobedience. Instead, pursue good. Pursue obedience. So you read the commands following this verse, 10 through 13. It says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Do not lag behind in diligence, but be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Persevere in tribulation. Be devoted to prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Those things are good things. Do those. Cling to those. But know this. Jesus did not die just so you could obey. He didn't die just so you could read Romans 12, 9 and do it. 1 Peter 3, 18. Peter says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. And you say, why, Peter? Why did the just die for the unjust? And he says, the just died for the unjust that he might bring us to God. The greatest good Christ's death bought you was not the ability to obey his commandments or even get entrance into heaven. The greatest good that Jesus' death bought you was God himself. And that is what we are to cling to. Cling to what is good. Cling to Jesus Christ. Do you want to give your life as a living sacrifice to God as an act of worship because of what he's done for you? Then Paul tells us, cling to Jesus and cling to him like a child clings to his father when he gets home from work. When I was a young boy, my dad would get home from work He'd open the door and he'd come in and me and my brothers would all just run up and we'd grab onto him. And I don't know how long we'd hold on to, but we didn't want to let go because our dad was one of the best things to us. In the same way, Jesus, God, 
has become yours, and he has come through that door. Cling to him, hold close to him, hold tight to him, as those who never want to lose or hurt or dishonor him. When seeking to abhor what is evil, you have to get rid of stuff that your heart has been longing for. And if you don't replace it with something, it'll start to creep back in. And you'll start to long for it again. So God has been merciful. And He is not just telling us, don't do this. Don't be associated with this. But He has given us something far sweeter than our sin. And far more joyful than the evil that we toy with. That is Jesus Christ. And Southside, I plead with you today. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. I have closing remarks. And then we'll pray. First remark is for the Christian. If you are a Christian, you've experienced this. You have a new heart. This new heart longs to love in this way. It has seen what God has done for it, and it is overwhelmed with gratitude and thankfulness. And it wants to love this way. And so my instruction to you is pursue what your heart longs for. Pursue what your heart longs for. And then there's some here this morning, I think, that have never experienced this. They've never hated evil in this way. They've never longed to cling to Jesus in this way. Their love is fully hypocritical. And yet maybe your heart's been pierced this morning. And I want to tell you that Jesus did not just die to pay for your failures, but to enable you to love in this way. And Jesus said, Everyone who comes to me, I will not cast out. And if your heart has never loved this way, then God is calling you this morning to come to him. And he will save you and justify you, but he will also give you a new heart. He will take out your heart of stone, and he will give you a heart of flesh, and he will put his spirit within you. And he will enable you to love in this way. Let's pray. God, We can only love because you have first loved us. And the love that you have showed us is unimaginable. It is unfathomable and immeasurable. We cannot grasp the height and the depth of it. And yet by your Spirit we look upon the Gospel and you have made it so that we would know this love. God, that is how we, want, we long to love. We don't want to be hypocrites who merely love externally, but are cold and dry and unloving in our hearts. We want to have hearts that are full of love. And out of those hearts, God, we want a loving, loving life to flow. So God, I ask, not just for the grace this morning, to love in this way, but I ask that you would cause your spirit to move in all of us. That Southside Bible Church, who already loves so well, would excel still more. God, cause us to love without hypocrisy. Teach us to abhor what is evil. And help us cling to that which is good. In your son's name we pray. Amen.